Welcome to this University of Minnesota Cardiac Surgery Educational Series. This video describes the valve sparing aortic root replacement. I'm Gabriel Orr, Division of Cardiothoracic Surgery. The valve sparing root operation was popularized by Tyrone David in Toronto and is often referred to as the David procedure. It involves the removal of an enlarged portion of the aortic root and replacement with a synthetic graft material. The aortic root is the base of the aorta where the valve originates. It has sinuses or spaces as well as coronary arteries. The ideal synthetic graft material will mimic the natural contour of the aortic root. Indications for the valve spring root replacement include dilated aortic root with normal valve leaflets. This could apply to either a bicuspid or a tri-leaflet valve. The size criteria are typically 5.5 centimeters, but may be smaller in the presence of a genetic syndrome like Lewis Dietz or Marfan syndrome or with a bicuspid valve. The reason to consider replacing the aortic root is to prevent worsening aortic leaflet function and to prevent rupture or dissection of the aortic root, which would be a difficult surgical emergency. The operative risk of dying from this procedure is on average 4.5%. This number is lower for lower risk patients and gets even as close to 1% for the lowest risk patient. The average 10 year survival is 85%. Reoperation for valve dysfunction is a concern for most patients and especially younger patients. In this series from the Cleveland Clinic, Lars Svensson, whom I learned many details from related to the valve sparing procedure, describes the long-term follow-up of patients with valve reimplantation procedure. In this series, the 10-year freedom from reoperation was 85%, which compares favorably with patients receiving a biologic valve. Patients younger than 65 years of age tend to have a significant deterioration of their biologic valves after 10 years. This speaks in favor of preserving the valve if possible. In the current case report, we describe a 35-year-old gentleman with Marfan syndrome and no other medical problems except for an enlarged aortic root. He had trivial aortic regurgitation, he had normal coronary arteries, and a normal appearing trileaflet valve. Preoperative echo demonstrates mild aortic regurgitation a dilated aortic root, and normal leaflets. The CT reconstruction also demonstrates the generous aortic root of the sinuses. Notice the normal size of the left ventricular outflow tract. This operation is best reserved for patients who benefit from keeping their native valve, and a good candidate will have normal valve leaflets, an isolated, enlarged, or dilated sinus, minimal comorbidities, and good heart function, to withstand a possible second bypass run if needed to replace the valve. The steps to the procedure are shown here and include cannulation with myocardial arrest, resection of the aneurysm, and dissecting far down around the aortic root to below the annulus, placement of subannular sutures, resuspension of the commissures and sinuses, and finally reimplantation of the coronary arteries. The procedure begins with aortic and bicaval cannulation. The aortic cannula is placed near the anominate. Once on bypass, you begin dissecting out the AP window, staying close to the pulmonary artery. We prefer bicaval cannulation so that you can place the retrograde cardioplegia indirectly into the proximal coronary sinus. This ensures excellent distribution of cardioplegia without worrying about protection of the RV or the LV. For the first few Davids, at least, this is very helpful. Remember that a small minority may require a second arrest interval to replace or repair the valve. We also place an LV vent to improve visualization. In this particular case, the LV vent went through a PFO, which we had to repair. Once the heart is arrested, we make a standard aortotomy above the sinotubular junction and transect the aorta. We begin the subannular dissection at this point using the rim of the sinotubular junction aortic tissue as a handle. We start by peeling the PA off the aorta and left main coronary artery. 
we continue anteriorly to the right coronary artery. It's not possible to get under the right coronary artery until the right coronary button is made. So at this point, we make our two coronary buttons and obtain about a centimeter and a half to two centimeters of length as you would for a standard bentol. However, you need to be cognizant of the fact that you need at least 10 millimeters of sinus tissue to reimplant the sinuses. So don't make the button overly generous. With the buttons fashioned, you can now more deliberately dissect around the aortic root. Light cautery is helpful here, since you'll find yourself dissecting off muscle fibers of ventricle anteriorly and left atrium posteriorly. In the words of uh, one of my mentors, you're not low enough until you've made a hole. There's some truth to this, since you need to be able to have your subannular stitches go as cleanly through the aortic tissue as possible. On the other hand, if you do identify a tear, you need to recognize and suture it closed at this point. We always take a final look around the aortic root for a last hemostasis check, as you will not visualize this region again once everything is constructed. This low dissection is one of the reasons why it can be a little more challenging to do this procedure in a reoperative setting because there's a lot of scar tissue around here that sometimes doesn't allow you to get as low as you would like. But it is possible. Now we trim the sinuses to leave about 10 millimeters of tissue to sew to. You want to leave enough tissue to make it comfortable to sew and resuspend these sinuses within the tubular graft. If you were to leave too little, you might start to encroach on the actual leaflets. Notice the nice triangular shape of the leaflets. This suggests that you should have a very nice result once it's resuspended into the Valsalva graft. We size the valve with a standard valve sizer and simply go up by 5 millimeters when choosing the Valsalva graft size. In this case, a 25 millimeter valve orifice will need a 30 millimeter graft. Here we trim the base of the Valsalva graft until only three rings are exposed. Now we begin with pledgeted 2O subannular sutures. We place one at each nadir and one at each commissure. We keep these in the same plane. For a bicuspid valve, this is modified slightly. These sutures should be in the same plane to avoid encroaching upwards on the commissures. Be cautious to avoid heart block, but you need to take these well under the annulus. Notice that the commissures had already been marked with 4O proline pledgeted suture just above the origin of the leaflet. This helps splay out the root and provide perspective. Take the 2O sutures now through their respective spots on the graph. 
Sometimes it helps to mark the graft at six spots to ensure symmetry. Symmetry, subannular sutures, and staying in the same plane are key to a successful valve sparing procedure. We seat the graft carefully, pulling the pledgeted commissure stitches out through the middle of the graft, one by one, being sure not to tangle them. Now we start by tying down all the sutures beginning at the nadirs. Once the nadirs are tied down, we then move to the commissures. You can cut your sutures as you go or use them as uh, stay sutures to splay out the root for perspective. Now you're ready to start resuspending the commissures. You do this by taking the pledgeted foroproline commissure stitch out through the valsalva graft right at the top of the neosinuses. In other words, right where the sinus portion of the valsalva graft meets the straight portion. This is a nice feature of this graft as it simplifies this process. There may be an art or science to this, but the graft is designed to minimize variability. In our experience, we have very rarely strayed from this lat landmark. We snap the sutures in place and examine the entire construct. Once happy, you can tie them with three to four knots and snap. You will use these later. Now you take a 4-O-proline RV1 needle and start at the nadir. Go in to out on the aortic tissue and out the graft at the same level. Take the other arm and go out the graft and tie on the outside for three knots. Bring the stitch back through the graft. At this point, you can pucker in the valsalva graft sinus a bit so that it starts to create a ridge for you to sew to. In this way, you can work within the graph going forehand towards yourself. Note that you need to trim the valsalva graph down to just a few rings above the sinuses so that you can suture comfortably within the graft. If you leave too much, it's harder to sew. A word of caution, it's easy to advance too much on the pleated graft. This may cause you to use up all of the sinus of the graft on one third of the graft and leaves you with a flat portion on the other segments. Stay low along the Valsalva graft as you go and gradually scallop up towards the top of the commissure. Ultimately, you go through your pledget at the top and tie to the previous commissure suture. We do the same for the other sinuses. You'll have to play around with backhand or forehand, and you can always take the needle out through the graft and come back in through the graft if you're not lining up the pleat well. This sewing is actually not that difficult to do with this particular graft. Do realize that this is the hemostatic layer of the construct. The subannular stitches only hold the graft in the correct orientation or support the construct. The running inner suture line 
has to be symmetrical and precise. You need to get enough aortic tissue, but be careful not to encroach on the valve leaflets. You can test the valve with saline. This also gives you perspective on the leaflet coaptation. If there's any question, you can address it at this point. Here, you see that the right coronary leaflet is a little bit longer. And it tends to fall into the valve a little bit, unlike the others. Thus, we placed a horizontal mattress suture at the leaflet insertion point near the top of the commissure to stretch the leaflet out by about two millimeters. This was just enough to cause the leaflets to line up well. We used a small pledgeted 5-0 proline for this. Once you are finished, you pick your spots for the coronaries and sew them in as you usually would for a bentol. We typically begin with the left coronary artery. You do have to be symmetric and precise with this. Oftentimes some bleeding that occurs afterwards is not from the root, but rather it's from the coronary buttons. Especially with the first few, take your time with the coronary buttons. Now you're ready for the proximal graft anastomosis. In this case, the aortic tissue was a bit fragile and torn, so we patched it with a small piece of bovine pericardium prior to completing the suture line. You need to bevel out the graft to ensure that you get a nice orientation on the final anastomosis. In general, it needs to be under some stretch since the heart will fill up, but not too much to distort the resuspended valve nor, of course, the coronary arteries. On follow up, the echo showed no aortic insufficiency in normal function of the leaflets and the heart. No blood products were transfused throughout his post operative course. The final CTA shows the neoaortic root with the new sinuses and the anastomosis between the graft and the native aorta. In conclusion, the valve sparing root replacement is a great option for a good surgical candidate with normal leaflets and a dilated sinus. The valve salva graft allows some standardization of the procedure but it still remains a challenging procedure that should be handled with great caution and respect.